I think the product managers will actually have time to get out and talk to their customers. And we're actually seeing more and more of this. Product managers spending more and more of their time getting out there and talking to customers and now being overwhelmed with how much feedback they have. And what do they want now? They want to be able to synthesize all that feedback with AI. So that's the latest that we've been building in and you can do now because now that you can do that, well, it makes it easy to get out there, talk to your customers, synthesize all that, and now know what to do with and connect it all up. So the product managers still have a job. As a matter of fact, the job that we always wanted to do, right? Your job was always to get out there, talk to your customers, get out of the building and understand what your users want, understand what the market wants so you can help your company figure out what to go build. And the actual defining part of it, writing the specs part of it, should be a much smaller piece of the role. Whereas in the past, it was a much bigger part of the role. It was quite onerous. Welcome to the Product Tea with Lea. I am your host, Lea Darin, and we are about to spill the tea with the best from tech about product, growth, and senior leadership topics. Good morning, everyone. Stuff to lollygagging, grab a tea, and join me and the person with a foot in many doors. Like being the co-founder of Mind the Product, an international hub for PMs with over 50,000 members. I didn't even know that we have that many in the world. But hey, more importantly, she's also the co-founder of Prospad, where she helps product managers to plan and deliver the products with roadmaps and planning and some other stuff. And today, we will talk about the end of all product management, how it ends, when it ends, and whether there's anything to do with AI or maybe whether it doesn't end at all. Jenna, welcome to the product tea. And now I just forgot how to pronounce your last name, Jenna Basto. Hey, good morning. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great to be here and love that intro. And also so funny that you mentioned the count of people that we had at Mind the Product. I think that was a really old bio actually, because I think there was like 300,000 or so at last count. And I've since lost count because I'm not sure if people know, but I'm actually no longer involved with Mind the Product since it was sold to Pendo a couple of years ago and has gone on. I'm still the co-founder, yes, but it's gone on to do other great things since then. But it's grown and grown and grown. So absolutely blown my mind as to you know how big the product community is. But uh, yeah, just product people everywhere. And I think as a craft, as a community, it's still continuing to grow. Yeah, I usually make the joke, like when you go into a meeting of an all hands meeting and you start to talk about product, you suddenly have only product <laughs> managers in the room. So we're only happy if we have like 8 billion product managers in a community at the end of, I don't know, like this century, probably. I remember there was a tipping point, maybe about five, six years ago, when you started seeing product managers being mentioned in pop culture, like in ads and in shows and in stuff like that. Before then, you'd never hear about a product manager. You'd hear about maybe a developer or a marketer or things like that. But I remember the first time I saw something about a product manager in like a pop culture reference. And I was like, oh my God, they know who we are. Yeah, did you know what we called this before that? We called it webmaster. I know. That's just what it was, like the webmaster, the person who does everything, marketing, sales, product, CSS, hacker, right? I was adding up how long I've been doing product stuff, and I made it about 20 years. And it's, you know, it depends on how, when you start counting, but I sort of added on the time that I was doing webmastering, because that was one of my first proper sit-down jobs, was I was a, a webmaster for my community college. I'm like, yeah, there we go. Webmaster. It was product manager. I hope people don't think we actually joke, but this was an actual title that I used to have as a webmaster. I was an actual webmaster, a web designer as well. Like was also Wait, do people not think that webmaster is a real thing? It's a real thing. No, we're old. That's what it is. It's just what it is. Okay, Jenna, just like really quickly, one question that I ask everyone. What do people get wrong about you once they get to know you? I did not prepare you for this question. <laughs> I mean, they always get my name wrong, that's for sure. And I really appreciate that you asked my name before we jumped into this. But you got it right, which I absolutely loved. By the way, my name's Jana Basto, so you got that one spot on. But uh, for the masses out there, what else? Um, uh, here's one. People call me the inventor of the Now, Next, Later roadmap. And I am, but I'm the co-inventor of the Now, Next, Later roadmap. It was myself and my co-founder, Simon Cast, who came up with that. And so that's the story of it. The two of us were in a cafe in Wandsworth, which is South London. And the first version of ProdPad was a Gantt chart. And I built it out of jQuery and pure junk code. And the reason I did that was because I was trying to replicate what I had been doing 
in my previous job as a product manager and we turned it into a digital version. And it was only by getting feedback from our early ProdPad customers that this timeline version that we'd codified wasn't quite right. And so we sat down together and sort of went, okay, well, if we didn't have this timeline, what would this look like? And this is where this first version came out, which was this napkin drawing that we had of three columns. And Simon titled it Current and Near-Term Future, which was later renamed Now, Next, Later, because that's catchier. And I remember taking it back to my desk and recoding it, throwing out the old version and making this new version and putting it out there and going, yeah, okay, is this going to fly? And apparently it did. You know, it's interesting because I'm old enough to have seen all movies that have ever been produced in uh, recent pop culture. And if I know one thing, that everything that is a good story has three commonalities. The first one is it was in some way related to a Gantt chart, a napkin, and probably a pub in South London. So in that sense, I think I support the story. This is exactly what it is. But we're not going to talk. We're going to talk about romance maybe a little bit for sure. Let's maybe lead into this anyways, because I, one of the reasons why I also invited you to the podcast is because I think you're a terrific speaker and you talk about something very generally, I think, misunderstood or like mishandled core discipline of a product manager, in my opinion, which is this tooling that we have at our disposal when we talk about expectation management. So like handling people upwards, downwards, sideways, whatever. And what we call a roadmap is, in my terminology at least, a tool for alignment And this alignment is dealing with expectation management. So you have the entire kind of circle now again. And with AI, we have this new kind of plethora of a lot of funny tools, existential dread and fears that have now come into our life. Like, is our job still relevant? Are we going to be replaced by AI? So without now going too much into the panic, but like, what is your take on this one right now? And because you're at the center of this as well, also with your product. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, AI is just another tool at this point in time, right? It's something that helps speed us up to do our jobs. I don't see it as anything more of a threat to our jobs as Photoshop is to a designer. You know, a designer from some many years ago would have had trouble pulling off what they could do because they didn't have the tools to do so. And today their tools are better and better and better and designers learn how to use improved tools just like the product people of today have better tools than they did 20 years ago. And the product people of 20 years from now are going to have better tools than they have today. And these tools aren't going to replace them. They're going to have better tools that allow them to do better work. But it's going to allow them to get to the points of product management that are most important. You know, ultimately, you've got to think about what product management is. And there's certain parts of it that aren't replaceable. And the parts that are replaceable, arguably, you know, shouldn't be something that, you know, requires a human to slog along and do if it can be done by a tool that we can code up and, nope. you know, more quickly to do without needing the tool, without needing the human. So, like, I agree with you in that, that AI makes it very easy to create some kind of roadmap, for sure. And again, if we just go now again with like, hey, it's a tool for alignment and so forth, like it, I think it's good to create some kind of alignment. But at some point in the future, I think we have PMs creating roadmaps with AI that they didn't even read themselves, just so they have one and they're going to present it like just like this. And then other people are not reading what is being presented because they have an AI note taker. So they can just like pretend that, <laughs> that they have read the roadmap that was created by AI and then consumed by AI. Where do you draw sort of this added human element of like, what do we add to a roadmap and how should we use it so it is actually still an exceptional thing versus, you know, we're going to get rationed away by AI. So here's the thing. I don't think that AI should be used for all things, just like you shouldn't use all tools for all jobs, right? Take that Photoshop thing. I mean, yeah, you can use it to do a lot of things, but a good designer doesn't just take a photo or an image and just lob on all the filters and be like designed. They figure out which parts of it to use to improve the design and you know knows which parts not to use to improve their final product, right? Just like a product manager should know where to use AI and where not to use AI. And a road mapping process probably doesn't need AI at every point in that juncture, right? There's certain things that you can use AI to help speed up that process. But fundamentally, the job of a product manager is to get alignment 
from their stakeholders and build the best version of their product that allows the business to, you know, build something that is going to be desirable for the market and valuable for the business and technically feasible and hit all the right markers. And in order to do so, there's a lot of different things happening there and AI can speed up some of those things, but I wouldn't expect there to be a magic you know, roadmap replacement tool that you just press a button and AI does it. Certainly not at this juncture. And actually, I have a story for you because I want to take you back to, this is 2013, so super early days of FraudPad. FraudPad only really launched as a commercially available tool in 2012. And in 2013, this is back in the days when companies did April Fool's jokes. Remember when Google was doing like internet over toilet IP and you know, there's some other fun ones like that. Well, we jumped on the bandwagon too. We made up an April Fool's joke and ours was around this far-fetched idea around what, you know, what, where's product management going? We came up with an auto magical roadmap. This AI natural language processing tool that was instantly built into ProdPad that would auto magically make your roadmap. Now, this is 2013. Obviously, this tech didn't exist. Obviously, there's not a tool that could sit here and read your entire backlog, read all your feedback, make a roadmap that was better than your product manager would make, and then communicate it out there to your product, to your team. And in the press release, that we put out on April 1st, we included screenshots of this hang happening and included pictures of screenshots of um, how it communicated to your customers. And the screenshots included this AI bot being quite snarky. It was clear this thing was fake, but it's also kind of cool, but fake. Now we thought we'd get a little bit of, you know, har har, a bit of press and a bit of fun out of it. What actually happened was some people actually signed up and went, hey, where is this thing? I'd love to try it. We had to get back to people and had to update the post, which is still live on our blog today with a big update at the bottom being like, by the way, this is a joke. Like this doesn't exist because people expected it to exist. They thought they really wanted this. Like that's really interesting. We thought we made it really obvious that this isn't a thing that we can do. But fast forward 10 years. So now this is 2023 and GPT 3.5 was just hitting the market. We got early access to it. And it was just around that point, we looked at it, we got access and we're like, oh my God, we could build the auto magical roadmap. How cool is this? And so over the course of the period since then, I mean, within the first week, we'd started building the first version of AI into ProdPad that used that GPT stuff. And since then, we've built all sorts of interesting pieces. Now, it doesn't have an auto magical roadmap that replaces your product manager and sends snarky updates to your stakeholders about why their stuff hadn't been included in the roadmap. But there are some really interesting touches in there that will do some of the grunt work and make it easier for your product person to get to that point. But it doesn't remove the human element of the fact that your job as a product manager is to surround yourself with the people in your team to figure out what's most important, right? What are the big problems to solve? What are your customers asking for? What does your team need? What are your bigger objectives? And then lay them out in a way that you can share them with your stakeholders and get their feedback on it. And there's nothing more important than actually getting that feedback. And an AI can't replace you on that feedback, right? You can't make a roadmap and then pretend the AI has given you feedback on that. You've got to show it to the actual people and say, hey. Oh, I think there's a couple of people who would disagree with you. I know there's some people who try to also create products with just conducting interviews with the AI itself, like to being the users and so forth. But I'm going to debate on that and we're going to see if that's any actually any good. I think my opinion is that you need to talk to real people to get real feedback. Because otherwise what you're doing is you're just getting the self-fulfilling thing that's going to potentially run you off in the wrong direction, right? We know that GPT has the potential to hallucinate. And if you're using your AI to interview fake users, you're going to get fake feedback and you'll build for a fake market. And it could be a realistic market, but it could also be an entirely fake market that's been hallucinated and it sounds really real and it sends you off in the wrong direction. So this is the thing, right? So we could talk about this in a second. I wanted to also like sprinkle in one story that has absolutely nothing to do with AI, but everything to do with 1st of April. It's a bit of a tangent. I'm not sure whether we leave it in, but let's see where this goes. So about two years ago, I was making a post on LinkedIn 
And I used to work for Microsoft, which is true. It's actually true. But I made a highly satirical post on LinkedIn about how I was called into a board meeting at Microsoft. I mean, I'm, I was a webmaster back then. I mean, a glorified webmaster of, of Switzerland, whatever. But like, I was working at Microsoft. So I said, like, you know, Steve Ballmer called me up for this board meeting at Microsoft. And then I was just making up this absolutely ridiculous story on like how I put an engineer in his place in front of everyone. And then my, like Steve Ballmer slow clapping to my intervention and everything. Like the entire story was absolutely ridiculous. I actually found the post the other day again. And it got up, it's still up there. It's still out there. And the funny thing is it got a lot of engagement, right? And some people did not really get that it was uh, serious or whatever, you know, not serious at all. Fast forward a year, I'm being invited into a podcast and someone did some really shitty background check on me. And he's just like, hey, Leia, so I seen when I did my research, did you have fit at the board of Microsoft? <laughs> and the story with Steve and so forth. And you want to go into this? And I'm like, I'm not getting what he's on about. I'm just like, yo, like, did he smoke something? I don't know. I'm not sure what's up. But it's so like, I kind of tells you a little bit about this absurdity of content and so forth. And I also know that AI is also struggling with this sometimes if it cannot really extract that something is sarcastic, then, you know, like for instance, what is a healthy diet? Well, according to Reddit, it's like if you're eating stones and dirt and so forth, right? So like there's a problem in there, but let's just go back to the particular topic here at end. So I do agree with you. And I also think that it's quite powerful as well. Like you can actually do good growth maps. Like specifically, I think unstructured information that is very hard to kind of summarize, which what a roadmap can be as well, right? Like it's a good summary of a direction that we want to take and so forth. But I did notice a trend that is giving me new challenges as a C-level. It doesn't matter what kind of C-level you are, you're a CRO, CPO, CEO, C, whatever. Up until this year, I was able to tell whether someone was doing the work by how it looked like. All right? So like, is this a well-founded kind of hypothesis and so forth and whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in every roadmap that we have some kind of hypothesis that goes into it, right? So like we have, hey, you know, like this is bet number A and this is what we want to do. And then you have some kind of, you have some kind of data substantiation that goes with it. So specifically for me, this would be like a one pager on a Google slides, whatever, like, hey, here's what I believe. This is because we have a low NPS over there, low engagement over there and so forth. I cannot check all of this anymore. It's not possible. I don't know whether this is true. So I'm starting to have a problem. And the other thing is also like when you're recruiting people, every candidate looks exactly the same until I actually talk about it with them, right? So there you can kind of sort of differentiate it. So let me just ask you a question now. How do I figure out whether a roadmap is a good roadmap if all of them look the same? And I'm not, I don't mean this in a stupid way. It's just like genuinely interested in like, how do we evaluate when the forum has been sort of solved? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the value of a roadmap isn't the roadmap document, it's the roadmapping process. So you've got to look at not just the roadmap as a snapshot, but you've got to look at what's gone into that roadmap. So actually, if you jump in and look at just a roadmap, you probably don't have enough information. You've got to talk to the person who's behind that roadmap and ask them how they came to that conclusion. You know, did they come up with it just by saying, well, I like doing these things? probably not the best roadmap. It's their first hypothesis of where they want to go, right? It's kind of like somebody saying, you know, well, I want to build these features. So this is my first sketch. They're showing you a napkin drawing of their strategy. And you're like, that's cool, but it's not a very solid strategy, right? It's probably going to be a crap idea by the time you get to the end of it. Or is it something that they say, well, here's where I started. You should see my first roadmap. And I threw this one out because I talked to, you know, this stakeholder, then this stakeholder, and I talked to this group of users. And then it, we went through this iteration and this iteration, and we learned this, we changed here. And actually we got halfway through this part and then we changed over here. So now our roadmap looks like this and it's been battle tested and it's robust. And this part over here is still a bit fuzzy, but that's okay because we're learning. And this part here, we're pretty sure these are the right steps because we've gone over it. We've tipped it a bunch of different ways. You know, we can't see any other way that we, you know, we're going to go any other steps. So unless you've got any other ideas, this is the best possible path for us. And so that's why this is the best possible roadmap. Kind of like the same way if you were to look at a, you know, if you were just joining a new company and you were to look at some designs that somebody shows you and said, you know, we're going to be building this thing. Is it any good? Well, you don't know. Maybe they look pretty. 
Maybe they look like they're made out of, you know, comic sans, like really basic. But is the fundamental design any good? Well, it depends. Has it been battle tested? Has it been actually showed to any users? Have they iterated on it? Or is it literally the first thing that somebody came up with? That's where you're going to get that picture. And so, you know, AI could have helped in either case, right? It could have come up with that first cut. It could have helped to synthesize some of the information so that you can sort of say, well, here's what this group of users said, and that might help you inform this. Here's what this group of users said, so that might help you inform this. It might have helped speed up that process, but ultimately, you've still got to do the job of making sure that it's exposed to the right types of users and that that information is fed right back in. And right now, there is no mechanism to fully synthesize and automate that entire process by which you are doing the road mapping process, right? And you are talking to all the right people and iterating on it because it is, I mean, sometimes it's a multi-month ongoing process. Your roadmap is a snapshot of where you think you need to be at that point in time, as opposed to this perfect document that is just, you know, click create and you are done and, you know, you can ship it. That's not ever what a roadmap should have been. You know, it's kind of like these AI note takers as well, where you just like you start to record a meeting and so forth, and then you have the notes, but you need to do something with them, right? Like, because if you do not consult them or you don't feed them anywhere, then it's like, okay, you have it now. So, but like, <laughs> so what do you do with them now? I can say personally that when I get roadmaps in front of me, what I really appreciate, and I don't see a lot of people doing this, I don't know why exactly either, is to just highlight also the weak points in them. So I almost treat it like a pitch deck in that sense. This is how I structure almost everything. I'm not sure whether it's actually smart, but this is how I usually do it. Unless you raise money where you just always try to just show yourself from the best side, which is also a little bit debatable whether you should do it. I really like it when we also say to like specific convictions, the chance of succession and so forth, right? So like, hey, we do not have a lot of data substantiation on this and so forth. Because what this does is it also allows criticism in and it highlights kind of like where are the weak points in our plan that we have. And that's totally okay. I've never gotten someone in trouble, at least in my companies, of a, like no PM got in trouble with me for saying, hey, this particular part, I just don't know. I know it's hard to validate, specifically in sales-led organizations, you know, like where you're not allowed to touch the customers and so forth. And this is really, really hard. But if you do that, like you say, like, hey, on this particular part, we have a lot of different metrics, like very, very solid data fundamentals. But like here, we just have a couple of we have a couple of sentences from the CEO. And so you've just touched on why psychological safety is so important. The ability, the fact that people feel safe speaking up and saying, hey, I don't know, or actually I'm not 100% confident in this. And you know, not even necessarily having an answer as to how they would become more confident in it, but just flagging it up to you or others so that you and others might be able to chew on it and say, okay, well, next time we get a chance to meet, let's talk about ways that we could test this or become more sure about it or gain some confidence around it or you know, narrow it down to a few options or figure out the right order of these things or whatever you need to figure out. Because there are going to be things that you don't know about. And I think it's really important that people feel like they can speak up when they don't know about this stuff. And I think this is another area where AI not only fails us and isn't going to be able to replace us, but might actually be holding us back because people go, ah, computer says it's like this. And the computer has, AI has this ability to be so confidently wrong <laughs> in the way that it puts things together that it can be quite dangerous. So we've been really careful the way, the way that we implement it in Broadpad in that we always keep the human in the loop. So, you know, you can use it to brainstorm so you can generate stuff. It can help brainstorm and say, you know, here's something you started. Let's come up with some of the things, but we're going to show it to you and give you, the human, the choice to sort of pick and choose and figure out which of the stuff you need to keep and which of the stuff you need to edit and which of the stuff you need to edit out. So you as the human are still making these final calls because you're the one with the brain here, right? This is just generating based on stuff it's heard in the past. And that's not how decisions should be made but also using it as a sense checker. So one of my favorite implementations is the fact that you can use it to say, well, hey, I've written this idea or generated this idea or we've got this thing. Tell me, is this any good? Give me feedback on my vision. Give me feedback on this idea. Does it actually line up with what's on our roadmap? Is this a strong idea? Can you give me feedback on this? 
and it will help give feedback on stuff and be sort of like a sidekick. So you can use AI for good in that sense, as opposed to just saying, well, tell me the answers to stuff. Just do it for me. I had a really good conversation with Kieran Flanagan about this, where he talks, so he talks more like from the side of like marketing. And he also said that, look, I mean, AI can do a, quite a lot if you train it the correct way, right? Like it's a, I think he's used the phrase like, hey, my AI or like AI cannot do strategy. That's not correct. It's not necessarily correct. Like you cannot do a strategy. And because you do not know how to do strategy, you do not know how to streamline this process with AI because that's the kind of thing. If you try to ask an AI model anything about data that it does not know, why would you expect it like it doesn't know you. Every time you open a new window, it doesn't know you anymore, right? So like this entire process of like training a model on your own stuff is also very, very powerful. I wanted to take like just one step back and add like a, a really interesting data point. I think I made this already a couple of weeks ago. I was conducting a survey also in my community about how many of the people that are reading or like answering this particular survey are having or like are living in a company culture where they are feeling that they can openly challenge leadership. And only 29% said that they can do this. And then I started to ask the, the other respondents, like, so like, why do you hold back? And about 40% said fear of repercussions, as in losing the job and so forth. Another 28% said like, hey, my voice is not heard. And this is fucking sad. I'm sorry. Like, I don't know how to say it otherwise. Like, this is really, really sad because even if you just like take the human aspect out of this, it's just bad business. It's really just bad business to treat product managers like just like the execution organ that you have without anything in between their ears. And I think it goes a little bit into this direction of what you said. Like we, in the 90s, I think we used to say that nobody gets fired for choosing IBM. I think this decade's stuff will be about nobody gets fired for using AI. Maybe, you know, maybe this is a phrase. Maybe I should, yeah, maybe I should patent this right after this call. Nobody's getting fired for using AI. And it's exactly what you said, right? Like, yeah, but the system said. We're kind of giving away the responsibility. And if I learn anything and then that opportunity always lives where people are not looking. And I don't know what it is. It's not good. It's just not good. Sometimes not a fun job, you know, like product management is just a very, very frustrating job sometimes. So I'm actually glad that we can get rid of this grunt work and so forth. I do think though, I think I also saw today is some kind of stats that growth PMs are getting, are being the, or the types of PMs that are being hired the most among PMs, like, so like, you know, sub-specializations of PMs. And I think while I'm not sure on the terminal, like on the methodology they used for querying this particular data, I do think that PMs who do not understand how what they do is connecting to the revenue and one sub-step of this is like a roadmap that addresses some in some kind of way the strategy they are, they're going to be in trouble in the future because this grunt work, as you called it before, is starting to fall away also because of AI in a lot of ways. It's good enough to write a JIRA ticket based on some voice notes that we will have in the future, and then someone can execute and actually code with it. I mean, this makes us more, it's not going to be perfect, but it makes us more, having more time for actually important stuff. I mean, I see the growth in the title, growth PMs, as I think a natural move towards companies who want to see a clearer return on investment in their product teams. And I think the term growth PM is kind of redundant. I mean, honestly, your product manager should be doing that. You don't need a growth product manager. But I think giving the title is a way to say, no, like we need to be able to see this. A lot of people call it the golden thread, right? Being able to tie through what is happening at the experimentation level and the design level and you know what's happening in the product all the way through to what's important for the business. And what's important for these businesses? Well, the last few years, they stopped growing. So they're saying, like, if we call them growth, are they all going to focus on growth? Yeah, because it's in their job, right? And if they don't do that, then if we don't grow, then obviously, you know, we know which neck to ring. And I think that's made it really tough for a lot of product managers who, many of whom didn't follow that golden thread, right? I think there's been a lot of lack of discipline in, I think, in tech companies in general. But now there's having to be more and more of it. Because ultimately, if you are working for a, I mean, let's say you're in a B2B SaaS and you're doing work that doesn't either you know, help you acquire 
customers or help you retain customers and you're not tying things back to growth for your business, what are you doing? Right? I mean, it's not actually helping, right? <laughs> and so I think this is just a reaction to trying to make sure that things are tied really, really tightly to the business goals. And that's happening at the recruitment level, at the HR level, at the business organizational structure level by creating these roles that are specifically tied, even though ultimately that's what the team should have been doing anyways, because what else were they doing? But I think there was a problem where I think teams were working on all sorts of stuff. You've seen over the last few years as there's been this tech boom, all sorts of products being built, many of which weren't necessarily helpful or valuable. A lot of things were just cluttering up our spaces. And now we're seeing lots of layoffs and you know lots of redundancies in the space because we built redundant products. So I think that's where that's coming from. But I mean, ultimately growth product manager, it's no different than what good product management is anyways, which is tying your work to what's important to the business, providing that you're working for a business that cares about growth, right? I think I agree with this. I do sometimes still make a differentiation between classical growth product managers and classical product managers in the sense that the growth part of a business is usually the sign up flows, onboarding, you know, like the stuff from like free to trial, trial to pro, that kind of stuff. So, like the more simple metrics that are very directly also connected to the revenue. And I think what's a bit unfair in the nature of the business in that sense is, is that if you are a classical growth PM that deals with this, so, you know, like moving the free part of the users through PLG or whatever you do to trials and then to, through something else and you have a very linear path. So you have a specific amount that comes in, a specific amount that converts and so forth. It's very, very easy to kind of calculate what it means if we have 50 more people signing up for this particular plan. It's just a simple calculation, like $50 times this many people and so forth. But when we talk about classical product management, it's not that straightforward, right? Like, so you have about, what does it mean if we have 50 more people who are very strong on first week retention? This is harder to kind of connect to the revenue. So I also am sympathetic. I am coming also from an area of product management with in, like being an innovation product manager that always starts from zero to one, where you just simply don't have the data oftentimes to just build on your hypothesis. You just go on with a very strong vision and then you dream up whatever is going to happen. And then you hopefully hope that, that it's going to strike something in the business. It makes it very, very hard sometimes to kind of learn these skills after the fact. And I wonder, I wonder sometimes what it takes to get there, but I'm 100% agreeing with you as well. Like this is just good product management. Let me ask you a very specific question, if you, if you don't mind. So I heard some people say that because of AI, we're getting more productive. I agree. But that this will also lead to an inflation of the teams in terms of like, hey, as a PM, you can now manage much more people. So we will see teams of like, hey, you know, 20 people, you just need one PM, which in essence, is also what you said at the beginning, right? Like this would mean that we would lose jobs. Not all of them, but some of them, right? Do you agree with this take? Because I thought about this a little bit. Maybe. I think there might be some jobs that end up getting eliminated. The thing is, is that there, I think there have been some jobs over the last decade or so that have erred towards a lot of the grunt work that can be eliminated, right? You see product managers who've been absolutely just heaped on with big piles of backlogs that they need to nurture and, you know, constantly digging their way out of, who are spending their time writing specs and user stories and things like this, and are constantly making up excuses as to why they're not getting out of the building and talking to their customers. And here we are, we're sitting here going, well, here's some tech that can help you keep on top of all of that backlog, right? Imagine you could just magically keep on top of that backlog. You have some things, a tool that will read everything in your backlog and tell you everything that's in there, tag it all up and keep it all tidy and help you flesh it out into user stories. And you won't have to write your user stories yourself. And, you know, you can just, it'll magically do that for you. Well, we're there now. We can do that right? All that grunt work goes away. But why were we paying people to do that in the first place? I mean, obviously we didn't have the tech, but now we do. So, you know, that type of job, but that was more of 
product owner role or certainly a more junior role and that wasn't really making use of the product manager mind, that's not really where product management has its value. Where product management has its value is getting out and talking to the customers. We never had time to do that. So I think the product managers will actually have time to get out and talk to their customers. And we're actually seeing more and more of this. Product managers spending more and more of their time getting out there and talking to customers and now being overwhelmed with how much feedback they have. And what do they want now? They want to be able to synthesize all that feedback with AI. So that's the latest that we've been building in and you can do now because now that you can do that, well, it makes it easy to get out there, talk to your customers, synthesize all that, and now know what to do with and connect it all up. So the product managers still have a job. As a matter of fact, the job that we always wanted to do, right? Your job was always to get out there, talk to your customers, get out of the building and understand what your users want, understand what the market wants so you can help your company figure out what to go build. And the actual defining part of it, writing the specs part of it, should be a much smaller piece of the role. Whereas in the past, it was a much bigger part of the role. It was quite onerous. <laughs> Yeah, and we started to have uh, funny frameworks like SAFE where <laughs> I'm not even going there. I know it's fine. No, 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 I'm not. So, but like, I think that the issue that I had with this kind of idea that we're now losing our jobs, because uh, by the way, I do not agree either, right? Like I'm with you on this as well, is that, yes, if you were able before to maybe file 20 tickets a day, now you could file 150, 200, 300 tickets a day. That does not mean that you're becoming three, four, five times more efficient and so forth. All of this is obvious. I think there is a human limit to a specific amount of different problems that you can deal with during a day because we are so in love with measuring the performance of people with things that we can count the amount of tickets, the amount of story points, the amount of revenue that someone generates, the amount of times that they cry into their hands while they're sitting at work and so forth, whatever it is, right? So like we love counting these things and then, oh, AI is coming around, now we're going to be 50% more efficient. We're not salespeople who are like dealing with a specific pipeline just like to phone off and so forth. And I think I noticed this as well, like as a solopreneur, there's just a specific limit to the amount of customers that I can take. It doesn't even matter how many that I have in the sense of like, whether I still have time in the day, it just means that I cannot hold the ideas of that many different clients in my head and also deliver a good performance. There's just a specific limit to it. So I think what you can do then as an unlock from this AI efficiency booth that you just described is get insights that nobody else could because beforehand it was not possible. And this is where opportunity lives. Like sometimes we just don't know what we're gonna uncover, that's true. But hey, if you go out and you talk to a customer, you come back, you have call, like you're structuring the entire feedback maybe with five more conversations and you come into a call and I'm like, hey, we should talk to these people. And you say like, hey, I already done this. Look, this was the finding. And we can use AI to kind of query the data. Isn't this fantastic? This is exactly what you should be doing. And yeah. Exactly that. I mean, this is something that we've built. We have a co-pilot tool in Prodpad and it knows we fed it, your, you know, everything that's in your Prodpad. So it knows all of your customer feedback. It knows what your objectives are. It knows what your roadmap is. We've also primed it with product management best practice. So you can ask it for tips, but you can ask it things like, can you summarize the feedback from, you know, customer X for the last week? before I jump on a call with them. Can you give me the biggest feedback topic we've been seeing for you know my product over here for the last 30 days? Great, what trends over the last six months are we seeing for that product and how do they differ these days? Whatever happened to that feedback I added last week? So things like this that you can use it for that otherwise you'd have to stop and either tap your product manager on the shoulder and disturb them or if you're the product manager, you'd have to stop and think, okay, where did I put that? How would I get that information? You know, how do I synthesize that? You know, you probably have it. You've probably got that information somewhere, but you've got to do the work to go dig it up and pull it all together. Whereas with this, it's there. It's already primed. It's already sitting there and it can just be ready for you with a sourced pile of information just at your fingertips. Whatever you want to know, it just pulls it up and then you can dig in further and ask more questions. This is such an unlock for product people so that from there you can then go, oh, that's really interesting. Now I want to book a meeting with that particular customer to go ask them more information about that. You wouldn't have known to go ask that customer 
And you wouldn't have had the time to go ask that customer for more information because you were so busy reading through all the feedback or trying to write some user stories in time to get something ready for the next sprint launch, whatever it was, right? Yeah. The first thing that comes to your mind when someone asks you like, hey, what was the most important feedback in your entire life? Then you just like think of something. It's not the most important thing that you've ever received. It's just like the first thing that comes to your mind. Whereas an AI has more time to think about it in this way. I think one tip in this regard that I learned as well when we were building AI products at Jua was also that, look, every insight that you're gaining is always dependent on the quality of the data that you're feeding it. And this goes a little bit like I'm just repeating myself again from what I said before. It doesn't help if half of your feedback is not in the model and half of your feedback is in the model. You, you just have one UX researcher feeding it in and then the other half does not and so forth. And this is what a lot of tools have been failing with in the past as well. Like, I'll give you a very specific example. So everybody loves recruiting, right? Like I cannot wait to recruit people all the time, right? Like it's such a great exercise of like always going through CVs and so forth, you know. Anyways, it's an excruciating process. And all these recruiting tools, they have stats and insights that they want to gain from this entire process. You know, like how many profiles did you go through? How much time that it does? Then there's always this one person in a 10-man team, 10-woman team, whatever, that just does not input all the data, falsifying the entire stats. You know, like because they're not following up, they're like, yeah, but I answered them already over the phone or I did this and that. And I think what's so exciting to me when we talk about AI is, is like how good it is in taking this unstructured blurb of stuff that you have. It does not need to be correct. There's not a syntax check. You do not need to do an SQL query for this. You could just pop everything in. Best example that I have in this regard is, is that you can take your phone calls if you have recorded them, you can have it transcribed, you can just put it into a text document, a literal .txt, and then have AI structure it and read through it, and we'll get most of it right. And I think this is where I have a lot of hope that tools like yours and any other tool is really going to go through the roof with its productivity because this kind of data feeding is also easier. It's not just the insights. It's like getting the access to the data is also becoming easier. Sounds a bit dystopian, though, as well. I'm optimistic. So, I mean, if you had told me this to my little product management self in, I don't know, 2012 or 2009 or, you know, way back when, I would have, you know, my brain would have been blown. Actually, if you told me this two years ago, my brain would have been blown. We were actually doing this the other day. I looked at a sheet that we had, an old Google Doc that we had, where we were comparing the notes between the questions we were asking our first AI tool in ProdPad, which was actually built in 2021 using, it might have been early GPT, like pre-3 GPT-3, but some early AI NLP stuff that we built in versus what we can do today. And back then it was like cutting edge, it was really cool, but you could synthesize your feedback and you could ask questions of it, but it gave one-liner answers and, you know, it didn't know everything. But even back then it was really cool. But if you look at what you can do today, where it can take your entire backlog and synthesize it and come up with complex, comprehensive answers, it's such a big difference just in those few years. And so, um, yeah, really, really remarkable to see what's changed. And, you know, a couple of years before then, it would have been like, that's impossible. There's no way you can generate text based on, you know, having it read feedback. Machines can't do that. Do you remember the search engine? I, was it called Wolfram or something? I'm not sure whether it's still around. Yeah, like I think I remember this like being the first kind of concept where you were just like, hey, you know, like you can ask it something. Like I think it was more about math questions. I don't remember now. Right. Yeah. Like, but that was also quite exciting. Like, Hey, you know, like imagine like, you know, like if you have the syntax correct and now it's more like, Hey, I mean, <laughs> okay. Funny story. I love doing these. I love to make smoothies or like smoothie ice creams, that kind of stuff that I have at home, you know, like, I don't know, cranberry, Greek yogurt, whatever. You just put everything together and so forth. And I made the mistake of putting a wooden ladle into it while it was still running. Don't ask me why. No, 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 just don't judge, right? It's like, I don't know. I don't know what's something's wrong with my brain, but that's what it is. I was able to go to my phone, whip up Gemini and say like, Gemini, is it dangerous if I have a little bit of wooden ladle in my, in my smoothie? And it gave me a comprehensible answer. This is the future, Jenna, I'm telling you. 
I knew that I'm not going to die from it's it. It's okay. So I you ate can it. eat blended wood, lightly blended wood. <laughs> if it's if it, well, it did warn me. It did warn me if the piece is too big, it could create internal injuries while I'm swallowing it. But because it was just like such a minor piece, and I just mixed it down, I was sort of okay. It's such a random thing. And even though it's a funny story, it kind of tells you like what kind of flexibility we have on generally available kind of knowledge. Now I fear, because I bet there's somebody with a medical background listening in right now, burying their head in their hands going, oh no, she didn't drink it, did she? <laughs> no, this was solid. They said like, hey, like, you know, it said like, make sure that the wood was not treated, that it's not like plastic or anything. It's fine, you know, you can eat the little piece of wood. It's not a problem. I'm like, okay, it's better than plastic. <laughs> what a bright future we have. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Now you can tell everyone that Leah is eating uh, wooden spoons. Before you... I don't know where this is going. Jenna, like I have just one more question for you. If you would, let's just assume you would start in this entire industry again, completely new and, or like you would have to give someone that is a young PM starting out and what would be the advice for them to just take away? Like, hey, what would be the first thing that you should actually learn? Like on a practical level, in the sense of like, hey, what is a practical skill? After this episode, they know they need to be able to create some roadmaps that have meaning. But what would you say? Is it more like on the technical side? Like, hey, how to get technical? This has changed quite a lot, right? Like, is it more like, do you have to become a prompt engineer? Do you need to learn how to interview users? Sure, you need to do that as well. But like, is there something on top of your mind where you feel like, hey, you know, like, this is a thing that you need to learn in 2024, I think, going forward? You know, I think the really key thing is learning how to be really good at asking questions. And this actually stands for both prompt engineering as well as for um, stakeholder management, right? Your job is not to have all the answers. The worst product managers, the most arrogant, and often the youngest ones, the newest ones, are the ones who go in there and assume because it's been given to them as a title, they're the product manager, so they're they're managing, they're in charge. It's their job to come up with what the product is supposed to go do. And they don't feel like it's their job to not know, so they make it up. And they come up with a bunch of stuff and it looks good because they made a pretty roadmap and the roadmap looks good and they get a pat on the head and they're told, yep, yeah, go build it. But what they haven't done is they haven't asked the right questions because asking questions is tough. It shows the points that you don't know. But remember, it's not your job to know. It's your job to ask the questions and to get in front of different people, real people, not don't ask AI to validate your strategy. Ask real people who have had experience with your market, who are actually using your product if they would use your product or you know, who have the problem that you're trying to solve, whether they would use your product to solve the problem. Validate it and use that to inform what you're building. So it's all your job to ask those questions and get really good at that. You know, it's funny because in some kind of way, you just I just realized that we are exactly the same as AI. Like we as humans, we're also just like hallucinating things all the time. I, I honestly think so because like when we do not have an answer, yeah, because we want to be competent, right? Like I would, this is 280 exactly who I was in the past. Just like, oh, you, hey, Leah, what are you doing? Well, I'm a product manager, you know, like, you know, so what do you do? I don't understand. I'm like, Arr. yeah. I was a terrible product manager for the first few years, like absolutely terrible. I had no mentorship. I remember when I first got the job, I, I went back to my desk and I was like, what is a product manager? And there was no information. So I just kind of made it up for a few years. And my first ever PRD, product requirements document for the youngins, was 80 pages long. It was so long because I included, I made all the designs and diagrams in there. And one of the developers convinced me that I needed to include UML diagrams no one knows what UML is anymore, but I learned how to do UML and I put them in and then turns out no one else knew UML. I'm like, you guys suck. And it was 80 pages. And then I learned that no one read it, no one cared. And I had to spend months translating it for people in meetings to tell them what it was that this whole thing meant and what I actually needed. And the whole thing changed so many times, there was no point in building this thing. So I vowed to never make anything as long as that ever again in my life. <laughs> this is so funny. This is so funny. I grew up also like in this era of waterfall, like planning of everything. It was so bad. And like now people ask me like, hey, Leah, so where do you find the time to write all these documents on your blog and stuff? And I'm just like, are you kidding? I used to be a product yeah. manager. But I wrote way back more. you had to be waterfall, more. right? Like, so I remember 
what the the deal was is that we had one development team that was shared amongst multiple product areas and you had to bid like you had to put in yeah you had to bid you had to like make a case in order to get your stuff into their quarterly release and if it didn't pass i don't know somebody made the decision as to whether your stuff got in or not if it didn't make in in that quarter too bad. Like maybe it would go out the next quarter. So you'd write this thing and maybe it would happen that year or not. It was nuts. So it had to be waterfall. You had to write the perfect document. Otherwise it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we were all seated on different floors. The, the developers were unironically always on the ground or the basement. <laughs> it's amazing. All the product managers in the second and the third floor together, even though they did not work with each other. They're just like, ah, the product managers and so forth, the designers over there and like they're in the creative corner. Yeah, no, no, good times. Okay, we're going to talk about this the next time. Jenna, should people get in contact with you? If so, where should they do that? Uh, yeah, great. I'm the only Jana Basto in the world, as far as I know. So come find me on LinkedIn. I'm super easy to find. If you find me there, let me know where you heard me. And that's always easier to find to connect the dots. Uh, or drop me an email. I'm Jana at prodpad.com. And love to chat to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I enjoyed this a great deal. Thank you so much, Jana, for being on the product team. This has been fantastic. Take care. Habu. Thank you so much for listening to the Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtarin.com, which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 